Yeah, that's a loaded question, isn't it? What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Lombardi Time Brews, where I'm your host, John Delray. As you can see, we've done this a couple times, but a little different of a video format today. Going to look a little differently because there is a ton of information in this video, and I wanted to be able to properly display it for you, at least if you're here on YouTube. Because today, we are diving into the world of the Packers draft and covering position by position what the team looks for from an athletic and testing standpoint. For the sake of time and information overload today, I am just doing position by position for the offense. The defensive positions are going to be posted sometime on Friday with our live Q&A on Wednesday afternoon wedged here in the middle. As for why I chose to make this video, it is one of the most requested topics that I get, something that I get asked about nearly every week, especially in the live Q&As. And everyone always talks about the athletic thresholds of the Green Bay Packers, right? How important they are. How Brian Goodacud sees the world in black and white and is ruthless about them because they're so absolute. Sometimes even how annoying they are because it means that they're not going to pick your favorite draft crush. But yet, if you're looking for a full consensus on what these thresholds may be, from the litany of Packers creators that are out there, it can be really hard to get a good grip. Sometimes, even as, an, even as I've been doing research, it's been difficult to find just one complete list as to what the thresholds are. So I decided to scour Brian Goodekin's former draft picks, all of the materials that have already been published from various sources, which I will name shortly, and compile what I felt to be the great consensus as to what the Packers' thresholds are. So, from the top, I do want to make a few things clear. Many of the Packers' scouting methods and thresholds were developed by Super Bowl-winning GM Ron Wolf. some of which are detailed to kind of a, I don't want to say detailed, that's probably not the right word, but some of them are talked about in his book, The Packer Way, Nine Stepping Stones to Building a Winning Organization. If you have not yet read this book, I would highly recommend it. He does go over a lot of his detail in leading the team to Super Bowl 31. And of course, there's been a couple GMs along the way. Think like the Mike Sherman years. Maybe you want to forget them. But Ron Wolf passed along these traits down to Ted Thompson and now to Brian Gutekunst. And so keep in mind that some of these have been tweaked over time. Obviously, 30 years is a long time. But a lot of this is rooted from Ron Wolf. Another thing that I would say is keep in mind, no one outside of 1265 Lombardi knows the Packers' exact thinking on every single pick. But looking at what the Packers have selected in the last 10 years, or even since Brian Gutekunst took over six years ago, there are some definitive patterns that arise. And we as fans can look over enough data to build our own predictive models. One of the unique things for us as Packers fans is Brian Gutekunst has proven in his draft methodology to be more rigid than most other GMs in the league. For instance, we can say with near certainty that an individual with a RAS under five won't be selected in the first four rounds by the Packers because it hasn't happened under Brian Goodkin's watch. Could it? Yeah. Will there be exceptions to this whole thing? Yes. If I said it's someone's short shuttle to be 475 and instead they pick someone with 477, yeah, there are exceptions. These are thresholds in some ways, these are guidelines, and certainly some are more important than others. But like with any data tracking, we can acknowledge that maybe if he chooses something like an interior offensive lineman in round one, it is a change in his methodology or an anomaly performed because of a rationale that we may not be privy to, such as filling an immediate need. One example is potentially being Amari Rogers, who had a RAS of only 5.35 and was selected in round three but he plugged a hole that they had been searching for for a few years in being a true slot receiver or potentially a returner as they tried valiantly to make that work for a long time. Or another of only minor exceptions was Lucas Van Ness, who posted a vertical of only 31 inches last year when most edges chosen by Green Bay had a vertical of 35 inches plus. Or how about that guy on the screen right now, Jaden Reed, who supposedly improved upon his Raz his athletic testing in a private workout with Green Bay, something obviously none of us are going to know about. 
And as for the almighty Revs, the Packers do absolutely use some kind of athletic scoring formula. And we can surmise that it's very close to Keith LaPlatt's relative athletic score. One of the ways we can tell this is Brian Goodkin's extreme lean towards high-scoring Raz players with very few exceptions. In fact, if you go all the way back to Raz's retroactive tracking to 1987, the Packers are above league average drafters of Raz at nine of the 13 positions that Raz tracks. There's also some non-threshold information that we can glean from Brian Goodkin's tendencies. For instance, Packers value some positions in round one more heavily than others. In fact, if you were curious about the last time that the Packers chose several positions, last time they picked a quarterback was in 2020, of course, Jordan Love. Offensive tackle 2011 with Derek Sherrod, wide receiver 2002 with Javon Walker, tight end. Bubba Franks in the year 2000. Tier, in terms of interior offensive line, there's a little bit up for debate there, depending on like, well, they picked this dude as a tackle. So whatever, it's either 94 with Aaron Taylor or 97 with Ross Verba. And then in 1987 was the last time that they chose a running back by the name of Brent Fullwood. Another aspect that we can consider is that top 30 visits actually matter now. Because unlike the guy on the screen, Jerry Alexander, who's drafted in round one and then said, I never even met with the Packers. <laughs> it was quite a surprise. Well, it's been changing, especially post-COVID. In 2022, six of their top 30 visits wound up being Packers, those being Dobbs, Watson, Toure, Wyatt, Carpenter, and Rasheed Walker. 2023, it was four, Brooks, Wicks, Nichols, and Clifford. The last non-athletic thing that we'll be talking about here that can be measured would be age. Of Brian Goodekun's first-round picks, all of them have been either 21 or 22 years old, with the lone exception being Devontae Wyatt, who's 24 when he was picked. In round two, you begin to see that creep up as all second round selections have been either 22 or 23 years old at the time of drafting by Brian Goodekunst. So with all of that in mind, let's hit the thresholds position by position. I'm going to give you what I've surmised to be the thresholds as well as a couple selections that would make sense for the Packers at each spot. Generally speaking, one earlier round selection than one guy who may fall to day three as well. There are tons of resources out there that I use to put all of this together, including the great work by the massively underrated and underappreciated in the Packers sphere, Brian Moffey, in his Decoding the Packers Way series for the ATB Network. The Packers Draft Guide, produced, produced by Packer Report. A great in-depth article on the Packers archetypes put out by Nick Bottiford of the 33rd team. An article on offensive linemen by Mark Oldacres over at Cheesehead TV. And of course, none of this would really be possible without the data tracking at raz.football by Keith LaPlatt. All of which is linked as much as I could in the description of this video. So we begin with the most important position on the field, quarterback. What do the Packers look for? Generally, they want their quarterbacks to be six foot two or taller. Weight being generally in the range of 215 to 225, although I could see larger being entertained if mobility is still present, because one common theme in all of their quarterbacks has been at least the ability to move and not be so statuesque in the pocket. And then, of course, of course, uh, according to Packer Report, they also want them to have 9.5 inch hands. In terms of that athleticism, according to the RAS database, the league average quarterback has run his 40 in 4.75 seconds. The Packers' average draft pick is at 4.66. In terms of starters, or heir apparents as we may call them in Green Bay, the starters must also have an incredibly strong arm with consistent comments of being able to make every throw, generally accompanying them. As for these metrics, you really do have to go back in time a little, as Brian Goodkins has only selected two quarterbacks in his tenure, one of which being Jordan Love, the other being last year's selection, Sean Clifford. And as for quarterbacks in this year's draft who fit these parameters, one would be Keaton Slovis. And although this would be a weight exception, another one that I do want to mention would be Joe Milton of Tennessee, since he was still able to run a 4.62 in spite of being 235 pounds, which would be larger for a quarterback than they've taken in quite some time. Next up on the list would be running backs. Selected running backs by, Bruno Good by Brian Gutekunst have been selected on average in the fifth and a half round, with the highest certainly being A.J. Dillon in round two of 2020. These selections have been 
Dexter Williams, AJ Dillon, Kylan Hill, and Lou Nichols. Yeah, maybe the Packers need to rewrite how they've done doing running backs in the last couple of years. But as the 33rd team noted, that the Packers, especially Brian Goodens, loves to select running backs with either a BMI over 31 or under 30, which is quite notable because the league norm for most running backs happens to be 30, and the Packers avoid that one number. In terms of the 40, they generally want their running backs running it at least at a 4.6, as none of Brian Gutekun's selections at the position have risen above that mark. A positional threshold might also include the broad jump, as every selection of his has done that in at least 10 feet. Now, in terms of weight, there is some interesting conversations to be had here. It's believed that the general threshold would be at about 205, but they certainly have not entertained running backs under 200. The desire, according to several comments from Brian Gutekunst, as well as Matt LaFleur over the last few years, would be something along the lines of 220 pounds. That also could be part of the rationale for signing Josh Jacobs and moving on from Aaron Jones, who it's rumored, who over the last couple of years has actually been like 185, not someone that Brian Gutekunst would generally draft. And the same thing kind of applies to Aaron Jones at height. It's believed to be at least five foot nine right now for Brian Gutekunst, but even then, most of his selections are 5'10 plus. Something to watch out for, though, in current events is the Packers have brought in Ray Davis of Kentucky for a top 30 visit, and his height is only five and eight inches and three eighths, according to some sites, while other sites list him at 5'10. As for some fits in this year's draft, certainly Trey Benson, Jalen Wright, they both come to mind. But so too does a player such as Isaiah Davis as a potential day three pick out of South Dakota State. Next up, one of the most talked about positions over several years for the Green Bay Packers, and yet not this year, would be wide receiver. And we can say for certain that when it comes to wide receivers, the Green Bay Packers, ooh, they like them big. And frankly, this is one thing that has remained consistent, dating all the way back to Ron Wolf. Players selected here by Brian Gutekunst include Jamon Moore, MVS, Equiminia St. Brown, Amari Rogers, Christian Watson, Romeo Dobbs, Samari Toure, Dontavian Wicks, Jaden Reed, and Grant DuBose. Also really notable and just kind of interesting, he shops in bulk here. Three times in his six drafts as GM, Brian Gutekunst has chosen three receivers in a single draft, and then twice he selected none. 2018, he picked three. 2019, none. 2020, none. 2021, one. 2022, three. 2023, three. Like it's just, it's an odd pattern. And that's not the only way that Amari Rogers was an exception because he was the only lone receiver picked in 2021. He also didn't meet a number of the categories that I'm going to describe nor did last year's second round choice, Jaden Reed, which lends itself logically to the belief that slot rate receiver may very well be its own category for Brian Gutekunst and company, but we just don't have enough data yet to really set it to the side as its own thing. So for wide receivers, what are they generally looking for here? No arms under 32 and a quarter inch. Besides Reed and Rogers, every single selection by Brian Gutekunst has matched this. Weight of 195 plus. For receivers under 195, there's always been acknowledgments in the post-selection interview of like, well, he was a little under the threshold, but we really liked him anyway. They don't say that for dudes who are 195 and above, so that should give you a relatively good idea as to where their internal threshold is. As for the 40... 40 yard dash, they're generally looking for that to be about four, five, seven, or faster, as everyone has surpassed that except on Tavian Wicks, who ran five one hundredths of a second slower at 462, but who managed to match everything else. Great, another interesting conversation here, believed to be about five foot nine minimum for the slot, but Goot really doesn't go under six foot otherwise. In fact, I believe six foot two to be the true preference, as five of the eight non slot selections are at least six foot two. Two of them are at six foot one in Wicks and Dobbs. Toure is the only selection that was an even six feet tall. 
another really important metric for them does seemingly seem to be the three cone. Under 7.08 seems to be the cutoff. Players in this year's draft that meet every single threshold include, frankly, not many. <laughs> and the reason for that is because a lot of the top receivers near the top of the draft didn't actually do all of the testing this year. So that does make it a little tough. It also could explain why they're bringing in at least one for a visit. I'll get to that in just one second. But we are looking at Adonai Mitchell of Texas, Johnny Wilson of Florida State as great examples of players that meet the thresholds, except they haven't taken agility. Cornelius Johnson, Luke McCaffrey are great examples of players that meet every criteria, including agility, except their arms fall just a wee bit short. But one receiver that again deserves particular mention would be that of Jermaine Burton of Alabama, who did not complete agility testing and fall short of their arm requirement. But they conducted a top 30 visit with him. Perhaps an indicator if the Packers are going to go with a wide receiver in this draft, which I think they will. They will need to conduct a visit with them to get more information or just accept that the absolutely perfect fit for all of their historical thresholds just isn't really there in this draft or may be attainable to them with where they are picking. The next position, one of the loosest of the bunch, tight ends. And yes, in case you were wondering, I did include a picture of Luke Musgrave struggling to get his footing there as he's reaching out for a pass just for Claudia. But in terms of tight ends, as I mentioned, it's a relatively loose position. If, when you look at all of the tight ends that Brian Goodkunst, even dating back to Ted Thompson, have selected, there don't seem to be that many clear patterns. And one of the rationales for that that I could come up with is maybe because it's not so simple to the Packers as they're all just tight ends. We know that the Packers look for every tight end to fill basically a different role on the team. And maybe that means that each one has its own set of requirements that they're looking for. Packers that have been selected by Brian Gutekunst at the tight end position are Jay Sternberger, Josiah DeGuara, Tucker Kraft, and Luke Musgrave. In terms of size, this is really the only patterns we can find. And this is dating all the way back through Ted Thompson's time. One thing that a lot of them have in common is a height of at least six foot two and a weight of at least 240 pounds. Most of the time, though, their preferences seem to be just a notch bigger at six foot three and 245. They seemingly are willing to go smaller for tight ends that they anticipate to be playing some form of modern fullback or H back like Josiah DeGuara. DeGuara was on the other underside of six foot three, 245 and yet they chose him in the third round anyway. Players that I've seen mentioned very frequently as good fits as H-backs in this draft and do meet most of the Packers sizing would be Ben Sinnott, Eric All, and perhaps the purest of the H-backs in this class, Jaheim Bell, although he would be teetering on the minimum six foot three, he's about 239, it's nothing a few cheese curds can't fix. Now, looking ahead to the position that a lot of people think is going to be the round one selection in this draft, no matter how you feel about it, the offensive tackles. Player selected here, or at least playing tackle, selected by Brian Goodkunst to be Zach Tom and Rashid Walker. Yeah, that's it. I was surprised there weren't more, too. And I also want to start this section off with a quote from Brian Moffey, again, part of his Decoding the Packers Way series. When it comes to offensive line, the Packers very much have a type. Regardless as to what offensive scheme they've run in the last 15 years, athleticism has always been a priority. Since Ted Thompson, they have an average RAS score of 8.2, and under Goody, he has maintained it with an average of 8.16. And I'm going to throw in here that this hasn't always been the case. Earlier in Green Bay's history and during the Ron Wolf era, the Packers were more willing to pick larger maulers, generally at the expense of agility. And a very large part of the reason why the Packers are below league average at Raz at all three offensive line spots since 1987. Since Ted Thompson took over, the Packers are well above league average in all three. So here are the details. Oh, and I should include this as well. I did want to say this. Ross Uglum, who covers the draft for Packer Report Packer Day, he put this out not too long ago, and I thought this was incredibly interesting. He said that the Packers place a very high emphasis, not just for tackle, but for all offensive linemen on their experience. Look at this list dating back through many of the Ted Thompson years. 
Sean Ryan was a three-year starter. Sheed Walker, a three-year starter. Zach Tom, a three-year starter. Josh Myers, a two-year starter. Royce Newman, a two-year starter. Ellen Jenkins, a three-year starter. Jason Spriggs, four-year starter. David Bakhtiari, three-year starter. J.C. Treader, two-year. Derek Sherrod, three-year. Brian Balaga, two-year. T.J. Lang, two-year. Josh Sitton, three-year. And that's incredibly notable, especially considering some of the tight top 30 visits that the Packers have conducted lately with the Marius Mims and Tyler Guyton, who only have a combined collegiate 22 career starts. Now that goes for all offensive linemen. So let's get back to the measurables for just the tackles. Here are the details. They do absolutely need arms of 33 and a quarter inch. And the reason why I say that, that that's absolute is because, generally speaking, anyone with shorter than 33 inch arms in Green Bay almost certainly has been moved inside. And that goes back quite a ways. The shortest arms that they've really regularly played a tackle did belong to Brian Balaga, and he was 33 and a quarter inch, according to Raz. And even then, as he was playing, it was viewed and commented on a lot that. This is about as short as they're willing to go in the arm category, so I certainly wouldn't be thinking anything under there. In terms of height, they seem to be six foot four to six foot seven, and in terms of weight, looks like three hundred to three twenty-five. Some believe as though that three twenty-five is a pretty strong maximum for weight, but after looking through all of their selections, especially dating back through Ted. I got to say, I don't know as if it's a hard maximum so much as it is just you're generally not going to get a dude who's 365 pounds and does the agility metrics that they're looking for because the agility metrics for the Packers are incredibly important. So it maybe is just kind of a, a logical leap there to say, well, maybe it's not so much a max. If they ever find a dude who's 370 and can do the three cone in under 782, well, then maybe he would be picked. So just something to keep in mind. Other important things here, uh, Jake Hansen kind of set the bar in terms of where the 40 is. This is for all offensive linemen. He ran it in 5.5. Most of the time, they're at 5.3 or under. But the most important metrics, and these do seem to be pretty hard lined, most of the time for all offensive linemen here would be a three cone of 7.82, that's the preference, or a max of 7.9. Short shuttle, 475 seems to be a very strong threshold. Players who could potentially be fits for the Packers at tackles. There's kind of three categories here, so you got to go with me. Some of these guys seem to be great fits, but haven't done the agility testing. That would be Kingsley Suamataia out of BYU or Kieran Amagaji out of Yale. Marius Mims fits the bill here as well. Absolute fits in every way would be Tyler Guyton, Patrick Paul. And then fits, but potentially could be kicked inside for non-size reasons would be someone like Jalen Sundle out of NDSU, Dominic Cooney out of Kansas, or Brandon Coleman out of TCU. These are three individuals who actually meet every single metric, but the belief amongst NFL scouts from the profiles that I've read said, well, these guys might wind up being guards anywhere. In the case of Sundle, this is someone who should return to his uh, former collegiate position of center. So we'll have to see where exactly, but they do meet the parameters for tackle in Green Bay. Then kicking it into the interior, there is some redundancy here with tackles. But one thing that nearly all of the tackles uh, or uh, tackles inverted to the interior have in common is all got tackle experience. According to Acme Packing Company since 2007. All but one of their offensive line and selections in the top 140 picks of the draft have had a tackle background. The lone exception was center Josh Myers. If you expand that from outside of the first 140 picks and actually just blow it up to the entire draft, then you're still only really getting three individuals who don't have any tackle experience. And that unfortunately would seem to rule out such players as Mason McCormick or even Christian Mahogany out of Boston College. Now, again, I'm going to remind you what I said at the top. These are not absolutes. Mason McCormick may very well be picked, but we can accept that it would be an anomaly. Packers chosen to be interior offensive linemen by Brian Gutekunst include Cole Madison, Elton Jenkins, John Runyon Jr., Jake Hansen, Simon Stepaniak, Josh Myers, Royce Newman, and Sean Ryan. Here, we're generally looking for guys who are six foot three, arms of about 32 inches. 
And overall, the Packers do seem to be a little bit more forgiving in terms of testing overall, but they're still looking for a shuttle of about 475 and a three cone of again about 777, according to Acme Packing Company. Players who may fit the bill here would be Graham Barton. And I know a lot of you are competing to say, well, Graham Barton could still play tackle. He looks like a tackle. It's just his arms are a little short. Well, for the parameters, it looks like they would be kicking him inside. Another one would be Cooper Beebe or Tanner Bordellini out of Wisconsin, or Zach Frazier out of West Virginia. There's also a couple fits here that just don't have any agility testing, and those would be Christian Haynes and Jordan Morgan. So there you have it. That's a lot of info, but that is, generally speaking, the Packers' offensive thresholds. And again, these are not absolutes. These are guidelines, and some certainly stronger than others. There are more players out there that do fit the thresholds to various degrees. I'm not saying that these are the only dudes that are going to be picked by Green Bay. Of course not. But I did want to give a small tasting as to the types of players that may be chosen by Green Bay in this draft. If you enjoyed this, please do check out Wednesday's live Q&A at 4 o'clock. We're going to be talking all about the draft, I'm sure. And then on Friday of this week, we're going to be talking about the defense and the parameters that Brian Gutekunst uses to pick his defensive players. Thank you so much for checking out this video. I do hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you soon. And as always, Go Pack Go!